Hello guys, Bubble here. After my last video, where I briefly mentioned the well-known HEMA instructor, one commenter told me that I should be prepared with better ammo if I'm going to criticize a HEMA expert. So, I wondered, what exactly is a HEMA expert? That's a good question, don't you think? I did some research and it turns out there is a shit ton of literature on what constitutes an expert, generally because the word is used colloquially and scientists are not very happy about it. So they've developed multiple ways to classify and define what an expert really is. Now, I won't be using any of those, but for the purposes of this video I've tried to boil them down to a handful of prerequisites, which I think will do the job. What is an expert? First, a person who has a vast amount of knowledge and skill in a particular area. Second, they have a proven track record in applying that skill and knowledge in that area. Third, they work on deepening their knowledge and skill in the area. Fourth, they're transparent about their knowledge and skill and the limitations of them. And fifth, they share them openly. Now, you can argue with that definition, but I think it's a good, if a relatively rough one. And according to it, I can definitely name plenty of people in HEMA, which I would call experts in one aspect or another. But let me tell you something. That doesn't mean shit. You shouldn't care who is an expert or not. Not when you're evaluating a specific claim, interpretation, teaching method or argument. What you should evaluate is the specific claim. If you consider the claim invalid because the person who made it is an asshole, that's ad hominem. If you consider it valid because the person who claims it is an expert, that's appeal to authority. Both of these are logical fallacies. And since you're on the internet, I assume that I don't need to explain what the logical fallacy is. Now, this video could end here, but I don't like to leave it unfinished. So, let's dive in with an example. In a recent article about swords in 133, Rowan Varzka claimed, and I quote, While there are shorter medieval swords as well, very long and tip-heavy swords with a blade length of 85 to 95 centimeters are by no means an exception. In fact, they seem to have been the standard. Let's examine this claim. Now, medieval swords is a pretty wide range. Generally, the medieval period is thought to be from the 5th to the 15th century, roughly. However, since we're talking about swords in 133, we should assume that the Varzecha means specifically swords around that period, and that manuscript is dated in the first half of the 14th century. It's a bit confusing, because he connects a handful of different articles, but in the end we understand that he is basing that hypothesis on four swords, half of them dated quite a bit earlier. Let's keep in mind, this is a claim based on four swords. Four. Do you know how many medieval swords are there in museums around Europe? Thousands. Making a claim on what a standard length of an arming sword was, based on just four examples, is frankly a bit ridiculous. Do we know what the actual average length of a typical arming sword in the 14th century was? Yes, we do. First of all, nowadays, in the internet age, we have access to a lot of museum catalogues. Many of the big collections of historical arms and armor around the world are published online. And before the internet age, we had uh, other types of catalogs, paper ones. But more specifically, there was a scholar whose job was for decades to gather sword information, and that was the lady or dog shot. You may have heard him. The typology he developed is the most common one used today. So, what do we know from his work? Well, arming swords varied a lot. There are some which are as short as 66 centimeters of blade. There are some which are as long as 103 centimeters of blade, almost as long as some rapiers. However, the vast majority of swords are between 75 and 
at most 85 centimeters long. There is this type of sword which was quite a bit longer than other arming swords. Oxshot terms it type 11. It's a generally a narrow blade, very slender, and specifically they are quite often over 90 centimeters of length, blade length. Of course, there are examples of type 11 swords which are 82 or 85. One of the swords Varsak gives as an example is a type 11. Yes, type 11 swords are typically longer. But Oxshot himself says that he would not date any of them later than 1125 or 200 years before 133. And concerning the idea that uh, the swords in 133 may be of specific type, that's frankly ridiculous. I think they show swords, a general idea of a sword. Maybe some later manuscripts which have a more accurate art, we can argue that some of the swords there resemble a certain type, but definitely not in the case of 133. And Okshot actually <laughs> addresses that. He says that specifically, well, we may think that type 11 shows in some manuscripts, most probably they are just swords. But if we look at all the other common types, their average blade length is about 30 to 32 inches or 78 to 82 centimeters, which accidentally reflects the most common length of Hima arming swords that you can find on the market today. Now, does that mean that you should only use average swords? No. I think that when you have the money and you want to buy more swords, you should definitely get a shorter one or a longer one or both. But if you're just starting out, it's a very good idea to use an average sword. In conclusion, evaluate the claim, not the person. And if someone is touted as an expert, but makes a bullshit claim, Maybe rethink if their reputation comes more from good marketing and less from actual expertise. Thank you and bye-bye.